people. And some of what happens in your mind when you're watching a movie is very much improvisational, like jazz. So thank you all so much for coming. And um, uh, I'm so pleased that you all uh, are, are close with Maria. She's um, a really amazing person. I'm a little jealous that you all get to spend so much time with her. Um, my name's Katie. I uh, operate a web publication called Lambly Optic, and I use my work um, uh, specifically writing a lot about movies to, to encourage myself to go see as many movies and as many different kinds of movies as I can so that I can draw similarities between different kinds of genres and different time periods and, um, and see uh, sort of human commonalities in different kinds of films. Uh, I just wanna start first and say, um, since I'm a native English speaker and an American, I don't speak any other languages and I'll maybe frequently use expressions. So if there's anything that I say that's not totally clear and you're curious, please let me know um, and I'll, I'll do my best to explain uh, some of my colloquialisms. Um, so, in my blog, Ambliopics, it's a, a way for me to combine art and theory. Um, I go to lots of different kinds of movies. I see old educational films and industrial films on 16 millimeter actual film, um, all the way to highbrow art films screened at Duke University lowbrow and cult cinema screenings, classic Hollywood noir, because I think that there's no reason you can't find wisdom in any of these. You can, you can find wisdom anywhere you can find motion pictures. Maybe a little bit more in some, but there's wisdom in all of them. So this is a talk about movies, what makes them, what makes them special. But I don't want you to think of it just as any one movie or any one kind of movie, uh, or just like you're going to the cinema to see a movie and those kinds of movies that maybe are just coming out. Um, because that is the movies, going to see the movies, going to the cinema is uh, cinema, but there's so much more than that. There's this huge world around movies that, um, by the end of my talk, I hope that maybe you um, have a different or a deeper appreciation of. So motion pictures can be YouTube videos, epic Westerns, what you're watching on the news. They can be very deliberate, intentional works of art. And they can be um, anything that the human mind can imagine, really, now that we have um, computer-generated graphics and um, other ways of imagining the impossible. Things like animation have been a part of the history of film for that reason. Movies are the world's newest art form, and they are here with a vengeance, and they want your souls. Uh, this is life on the z-axis, what I'm calling the z-axis, and it's, it's intended for us to go deep with this. So on the left, you can see the phenomenally successful silent film actress Lillian Gish. If you had been alive at the early part of the 20th century, you would definitely have known who Lillian Gish was because movies were a hugely popular art form. Everyone went to the movies after movies were invented. It, it was a, a democratic art form in that it appealed to lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds. And um, when movies were invented, they were so popular with normal people that highbrow, people in the fine arts 
were questioning whether or not movies could even be art. Were they just recording what, what was in front of them or, or could this be something new? So while critics are asking themselves, is our movies art? Silent film stars were making massive fortunes beyond your wildest dreams because film was beloved by most people right away. So let me see if this will let me proceed. <laughs> okay, so. The reason I called this the Z axis is because um, when you're looking at a, a movie, it seems like it should all be on one plane like you're just looking at a single flat surface. But there's a lot that's going on behind the camera that you're not seeing. There's also a lot going on in your own mind that maybe you're not consciously aware of. So in this frame, you can see in the top center, there's light that's going straight to Lillian Gish's forehead. There's also light that's coming from the bottom left-hand corner. And there's also light that's going straight into your eyeballs. So there's a lot of dimensionality. There, there are so many dimensions that are happening with a frame of film and when you're watching a motion picture that you don't necessarily think about all the time. So the Z-axis is a way of indicating depth. Um, and you can see here, I just pulled a, a quick image search off of Google to, to try to show what the Z axis is. But if you look at these graphics, they're very abstract. It's still a little difficult to conceptualize where, where the Z axis is. Um, I think maybe if anything, this fat arrow <laughs> is maybe the closest, but but the z-axis is uh, a way of describing depth. So not just the length, not just the height, but what's going in and out of um, of an object or a, a thing. So I think I got ahead of myself a little bit. So Katie, uh, just one question. This is a concept that is still used in cinema and it relates the object to light so that we see things the way our brain needs to see them? Is more than Well, the Z-axis is used uh, or is at least considered in filmmaking. You have to consider the, the element of depth because otherwise you can't compose a shot and keep space consistent. So there are certain rules like the 360 degree rule or the, the 180 degree rule where if you're shooting something, you can't have the camera cross the Z axis because it will mess up the framing and it will make space suddenly not make sense when you cut the shots together. So the z-axis is very important. It's just kind of invisible. The way we are usually thinking of, you know, the frame is this and this, you know, you can do this to, to get a film frame, like simulate a film frame. But the film frame is as much about what was on the other side of the camera that you can't see and what's inside of you that you're not necessarily thinking about. Um, so, let's see. Um, in the past, people who thought about film got stuck on its limitations. They wanted to find some boundary. They wanted to find a way to, to define film. It's a frame, it's closed in, you know, it's not reality because it's just happening right here. Reality is what's happening outside of the film. Whatever is shown on the frame is on, is on purpose. Someone meant to show you that. So it can't be the whole story. But I think there are lots of good reasons to believe that film tells a more complete story than many other languages that we have. 
it can speak dimensionally in a way that's difficult to articulate even with language. So if you look at these pictures, trying to explain what depth is with the z-axis. Excuse me, pretty, can, I, can oh, I make sure. a question? Absolutely. Yes. Um, can we say that um, movies have borrowed the, the z-axis from theater? Theater would definitely have considered the z-axis in blocking and staging on a stage. But because movies are not just dealing with that, um, there's a constraint of space that you have in theater that is not going to be an issue with movies because you can shoot on location. There are many more opportunities for parallax. So you definitely would have it in theater. You would also have it in painting, uh, in the development of the history of, of Western art, painting used to be very flat in the Middle Ages. And then um, it wasn't Giordano Bruno. There was a painter, a Renaissance painter in the 1300s that started to um, use atmospheric perspective and use perspective in his painting so that he could simulate depth. So Botticelli, depth was, Botticelli. Was it Botticelli? Botticelli, or, or one, I yes, I think they, his paintings make, make us see the depth of the, of the scene. That was one of the most beautiful things about the painting of the Renaissance, was that you have this transition from those two-dimensional, um, those two-dimensional frescoes uh, and paintings to very realistic and detailed uh, paintings that are that you can you can have that because of depth. What yeah. those artists were most interested in was depth. Maria, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I was just thinking of Gothic altar pieces in our area, which most of uh, my students might be familiar with. So when, when you have that transition, you start seeing, for example, tiled floors to, to, to help simulate that depth. And then in outside uh, scenes, like the crucifixion, you start seeing a landscape in the background with a river that is uh, flowing. So yeah, like people came up with all sorts of um, uh, devices to simulate depth. It's been, um, it's been a human project for a long time to try to understand and, and illustrate depth, but I think that movies do it about as well as anything. Um, they definitely do it better than, than these pictures, right? Like these are really abstract pictures. They can show you the mathematical concept of depth, but they don't really, they don't really communicate what depth is like, what it's like to experience depth, what it's like to see or, or feel something in depth, while movies can do that. So before you have all these crazy processes going on with movies, they have to be created first. So what do you need? The first thing you need is light. Movies don't happen without light. It's the most fundamental component. And because this is the substance of movies, there's a lot of depth you can get from this if you start looking at something like the physics of light. I'm not gonna get into that because it's a huge topic and one that I really love, but just suffice to say, you need light for movies. You also need a camera. You have to find a way to record the light and, and be able to work with it as a medium. But you actually have two cameras. When it, when it comes to a movie, there's at least two cameras. There's the camera that's recording the action. There's also the camera of your mind and your eyeballs. Uh, this is a whole other process that's happening when you think about a movie as an object because 
the film is complete when you put light on the performer. It can come from more than one direction, usually. Then the camera is recording the light into a hard drive or onto a physical film stock. It's the same light that was there projected so that that could be recorded by the camera. But if you look closer, you can see there are two cameras. There's one that has recorded the action and your mind is the second camera because you make the film complete when it is projected and then reflected into your eyes or just projected straight into your head if you're watching it on the screen. The audience sees the film, but the film also sees the audience or at least an audience. The camera sees but it can't see unless people are viewing what the camera can show them. It doesn't mean anything without someone interpreting it. Movies were born not just because someone made a strip of film, but because in 1895, someone had the bright idea to show that film to an audience. The crew makes the movie behind the camera, the performers show you where to go with your feelings during the movie, but the movie doesn't complete until it's in your mind. And that's where all this action is coming from. You need lights, you need a camera, and you need action. But you're not a passive observer as an audience member. You're not a blank slate. You bring your own experiences to the experience of the film much in the same way as all of that writing and all of those lights and all of those performers. So how is depth shown in the movies and what happens when depth is shown? Camera lighting and lens advances in cinema have meant that you can record a scene and show everything in focus from what's right in front of the camera all the way back. This was a huge deal in cinema. Uh, if you've ever heard of, sort of Citizen Kane, uh, that was uh, Cuidadano Kane. There's a title yeah. that makes sense. Right? Maria tells me that the sound of music translated into smiles and tears. Rosewood. Rosewood. Ciudadano Kane. Kate. Rosewood. I'm sorry, Nacho, did you say Rosewood? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rosebud, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, Nacho, I'm glad you've, I'm glad you've seen Susan yeah, for, Kane. For Maria. Maria Jose, can, can we see uh, Kat in full screen mode? Because it's so little in the in the in the edge. Maria Jose? I know. I think I I have it on full screen. I think it's actually it's actually her. She's controlling those those uh, settings. I don't know if you okay. can make your presentation bigger. Uh, are you okay, watching okay. it in your well, there cell phone? It might be a zoom, like a zoom setting. There could be like a gallery view or a, a speaker view on zoom. I think there's two different ways. You can either have like one big frame and lots of small videos for the participants, or you can do like a gallery view that has all the participants. I think. I think, yeah, we have done it. Don't mind, it's not important. I'm sorry, Nacho, I wish I could help more. <laughs> no, no, at all. Tú puedes arrastrar con el ratón hacia la izquierda, hacia la derecha. I mean my, my phone, mobile phone. Ah, okay. <laughs> don't mind, don't mind. Well, I'm not sure. Um, I've told Maria before that um, I'll be sending the slides, copies of the slides as well. So, if there's anything you want to to go back and reference, you'll have the slides. Um, 
Okay, so with Citizen Kane, you've got the ability to show depth in focus throughout the film frame. And, and oh, Orson Welles is, is a master of that. Yes, Orson Welles loved that, that deep depth of field. And um, I mean, he's such a wonderful artist r regardless. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard his War of the Worlds, but it's terrifying. <laughs> I love um, the, the third man too, it's, it's fantastic. I also love the third man. I was in Vienna, it was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Um, so regardless of the, the inaccuracy of the translation for Sound of Music to Smiles and Tears, Smiles and Tears is what you get on the Z axis. When you deal with depth in film, films are feelings. They show us our feelings. So you also get the academic approaches to knowledge, you get uh, stories of good and evil, you get big questions, big ideas, big feelings shown in films. You also get some relief from not knowing what reality is. I'm not saying you don't know what reality is. I'm saying you do know as long as you have a mind that thinks about it. Um, It makes me think about The Matrix. Yeah, The Matrix is a really great movie to do things like um, philosophical thought experiments. Uh, movies are better at this, I think, than philosophy because as much as I love philosophy and I love reading philosophy, it's so dry and it's so easy to think of yourself as separate from the person who's writing and, and sometimes very difficult to see how those ideas might impact your life or what they really mean. In a movie, you have, you have the ability to show a big idea, create a whole world to, to simulate that, and then you as the audience member can draw connections between the world on film and the world of your own life. It, it's it's much easier to do and it, it's an easier way to take the medicine, right? Like everyone likes thinking about what's real a little bit, at least, you know, it, even if it's only in times of crisis, even if it's only uh, when the worst things are happening. But you're, you're going to face the questions at some point. And I think that movies are a really great way of working through not knowing because they show you a way that you can know you can know what's going on in this story you can know what this character's feelings are you can know all these things this depth of of what's being shown to you in a movie movies are ultimately working with our minds and and have the ability to change and question what's going on in our minds if you feel like you're stuck, if you feel like you're always thinking the same way, movies can be a good way of shaking you out of it, making you ask questions where you had just been assuming a lot of things before. But film is a really cool medium too because it it uses elements from all of the arts. There's visual art uh, in the art department and in the camera department. You're dealing with painting, sculpture, drawing, design, composition, photography, all of the visual arts bear on the medium of film. You also have music, whether it's because there's a composer, someone has to do sound recording, sound effects, the soundtrack, and you've also got movements that have to be orchestrated. So similar to an orchestra playing a symphony, you have to have all of these elements working in tandem to create the ultimate work of art, which would be the film. You've also got elements from theater that go into cinema uh, as far as the, the crew, the, the people who make the film happen, all of the, uh, like the 
the people who have to organize the schedules, the people who organize the blocking, the actors and staging on the, on the stage. So you've got elements of theater and you also have elements of dance. So this is an early uh, Thomas Edison film, Serpentine Dance. I don't know if it should... So um, even dance uh, is included as um, a contributor to the art of cinema. And just to illustrate this point a little further, I was very excited to find out that he's from Aragon. <laughs> yes. Sucaranda, del well. The so, beginning of um, his... I hope that some of you have at least have seen Unchen Andalou, but um, I want you to think while we're watching this, of all the different arts that are that are being involved in the movie so you're going to have sculpture with the prop design you're going to have cinematography photography in the way the shots are composed you've you've got um the element of dance when you're thinking about the the choreography of the movement Take care of this. <laughs> it's terrific. Horrible. It said that's a film, a biographic film. And this is the birth. So unfortunately, we don't have enough time to watch the whole film, but I wanted to just give you a taste and, and help you to maybe start thinking about all of the ways that different arts um, play into works of cinema. Let me see if I can bring this back up. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So how is philosophy similar to cinema? This is um, a point that's really important for me. So like it, similar to the way film uses multiple mediums to communicate and, and combine information into the same setting, philosophy does this also in that it questions a broad range of subject matter. You have questions of science, religion, art, literature, language, how we can know anything. Philosophy takes all of these disciplines and puts them in the same context so that someone can ask questions both of language and art in the same context. It's a way to be able to think about the unity of knowledge or the unity of, um, of even reality. So what does it take? What is, what makes a movie? 
you've got the the most important thing to start is that idea and the story elements the writing the the content that goes into motivate the rest of what happens to make that film a reality in order to make that film a reality you've got to have at least some kind of audio and some kind of visual it's an audio visual medium it's a way of taking sound and and what you can see and combine them into the same format and then you've also got the audience, so film cinema as an art doesn't happen unless there are people programming movies and showing them to audiences, whether that's someone at Netflix who's choosing titles to include on the platform, or whether that's someone who uh, programs at a movie theater to decide what titles are gonna be shown on the screen. So all of these things are necessary for cinema. So originally, like you saw in Serpentine Dance, the Edison film, cinema started as um, movie shows of recordings from everyday life, just a way to record what was right in front of people's faces. And then people started experimenting with it. Like uh, there's one where um, one of the Lumiere films, uh, the demolition of a wall where it's it that's exactly what it is someone demolishes a wall but then they started experimenting with the cinema medium and saw that they could reverse time so it's the demolition of the wall and then it's the repair of the wall cinema does things that only our minds could do before and it augments the reality of our minds and makes it possible for them to expand and consider many new um opportunities or possibilities. Meanwhile, theorists are going, is this art or is it just copying reality? But then we can also ask the question, is, is what I see reality or is this medium just a way to fix or capture moments that would disappear with time? Even if that's so, that was not possible before. You can trap light with cinema and, and make that moment real into time. So at first it's just recordings, but then in film history, story comes along. People want to start depicting story. They don't just want to record what reality looks like. They want to, they want to tell a story through the medium because of editing. Not just because of editing, but but that was ultimately where the medium led. So you have two schools that come from this. You wanna tell a story, but the realists wanted to tell a story just like you see it in real life. The expressionists instead really embraced in that way that we were talking about all of the arts impacting cinema. The expressionists wanted to take art, any of the fine arts, any sculpture, painting, etc., and animate it so that those stories and that art could be told in a moving picture. So with that, you have a, an Apollo versus Dionysus split. The, the realists are very much Apollo. They like for things to be orderly and static and reasonable and logical while the Dionysians, the expressionists, are just like, feel something, feel something. Let me show you how your feelings really look. Let me show you this horror. <laughs> so it gives us opportunities to explore the polarity in our psychology. So as much as it can be a big grand story, it can also show us the beauty of small things, little fragments uh, and, and temporary things. And, and that goes for, for our own vulnerabilities and fragility as well. It can show us ourselves at our lowest point and, and maybe even help us to, to grow and, and to, to become bigger, better, stronger versions of ourselves, like the characters that we watch on the screen. 
Katie, you're just talking about film therapy, maybe. Is there anything like film therapy? I think that people do it without without having it as um as a program. Uh, I I know that there are art therapy programs, but um but I think that when people go to the movies, maybe they don't they're not having a psychotic break at that moment, but maybe maybe there are things that they're not proud of or that they're having a hard time with. And the process of going to a movie um, can be therapeutic, but I think it depends on the person. Some people are averse to therapy, so they're just going to go watch Mel Brooks movies. Um, but maybe, maybe someone else is going to go for the David Lynch and and start digging up some some dark hearts. Inside yeah, themselves. but I mean, sometimes you also need to laugh. So I can I can see somebody just going for Mel Brooks just for for shits and giggles. Sure, sure. Um, I'm more of a Will Ferrell fan, but yeah, it it's good. It, this is the wonderful thing about movies. You have a, a short period of time where a single work is going to hit your eyeballs, but there's this whole world of movies. So it's it's ways of tapping into different parts of yourself as much as it is different worlds. Um, so sometimes, yeah, that laugh is just as cathartic. It's just like the comedy and tragedy um, that started this whole enterprise of story with Greek drama. It's needing to really feel deeply those feelings and have that catharsis be able to release it have it mean something and and be contextualized in your experience smiles and tears smiles and tears <laughs> exactly um so if you ever start digging around trying to understand movies there's just there's so much information about movies there are production histories there's the history of the development of movies as an art there's um different critical approaches whether it's freudian or marxist or feminist there's modernism there's semiotics the, so so you've got the history of film how film played out in history you've also got theorists who are trying to understand film from that point of view try to figure out what films mean but most central and most important is how movies inform our experience so this is a, a a way of showing how you go a little bit deeper and deeper with movies. History, you can find out what happened on the surface. You can find out what was reported about how cinema developed. You can look at how techniques and tools of making movies has changed and grown over, over the, the last century. But then if you go a little deeper, you can go into those critical perspectives. You can see how um, someone who's maybe a Freudian or, or interested in uh, psychoanalysis, how they might see the meaning of a particular film. Um, theorists will also be the ones who are asking themselves whether film matters. Um, is it is it just fake? Is it just uh, just a thought experiment, or or does it tell us something more fundamental about our reality? And then at the deepest level, you have experience. You yourself, the audience, does this make sense to me? Does this movie make sense? More importantly, do I like this? Does this speak to me? I think that's the most fundamental reality that you can have with a movie. So this is the path that the light travels. For you to see a movie, you start with the light itself. And, and that's the most fundamental element of a movie. 
truth of the movie can be the light that was projected onto the performer so that it could be recorded by the camera. That light is true. It's honest. It was there. It happened. Truth can also be the recording of that light. It's a way of documenting and saying, yes, definitely there was light there. Look, I can show you it's been recorded. So the light goes from its own existence to being recorded, and then it has to be viewed. So it's also just as true to say that the light is in the act of showing and seeing the movie. It's, it's that light traveling from the performer to the camera, to the screen, to your eyeballs. And once it's in your eyeballs, there's no reason to say that the truth of that light that you're seeing isn't in the eye of the beholder. The reception of the film can be true for the subject. So if someone watches a film and says, that sucked, that's their opinion and it's just as true as the light that originally fell on the performer. When you find that something is true, you want more of it. You have a, a desire that, that sparks in you. You see a, a light that once fell on a performer, eventually goes into your eyes, inspires that fire in you, makes you feel alive, makes you feel that your reality is either questioned in a substantial way or confirmed in a beautiful way. And then you want more, you, you, you want more. So that desire, that fire that you get, that inspiration, then turns into more light. You look for more movies, you look for more inspiration. So in all of these paths, there's a truth that is fundamental. Hi, Katie, can yes. you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm Fernando. Nice to, to meet you. Hola, Fernando. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, don't, you. I don't speak Aragonese, but I speak a little bit of Spanish. It's, it's, yeah, I'm so uh, excited, your, your speech. But in the, in, 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 uh, in the poem before, before you, 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 have, you have told us that when Okay, when something is true, you want more desire. Mm, I can see your point of view, but I'm not really, I'm not really seeing, seeing the same because, uh, as you know, the, there are uh, some kind of thing called a uh, disgusting thing. Uh, for, for instance, mother from uh, uh, by uh, Aaron Aronofsky. Aronofsky, yeah. So, yeah. I well, it's, it's, it's a very good film. Is uh, the the light is very very good. All all, all all the points are true. But in fact, when I watch this film, I don't want more. Oh well, I, I, I definitely I, don't mean that you want to rewatch that film over and over again, especially yeah. with these really intense films that okay. deal with these really dense topics. Yeah. I'm the same way. I like to watch it the one time yeah. right. and but just let it do. But, I, but I mean, I, I, I'll have to ask you the question then, are you going to avoid more films that are like Mother or are you going to be curious uh -huh. and want, maybe it's not that, film but maybe okay. David Lynch comes out with a new film or Aronofsky or Von Trier or any of these guys who make these yeah. really dark dense films uh -huh. right like you're if the if if you were touched by mother maybe uh -huh. you don't want to see mother again but you you're probably gonna want to see another film that's like it that yeah. that deals with the same kinds of topics so All right. I think that's true for, for different people's tastes and genre. So if you're someone who really likes comedies, you're gonna have a good feeling about that comedy. Maybe you don't, uh, actually I find comedies a lot easier to rewatch over and over again. Like if I like a comedy, I'll be able to quote it. 
I can quote almost the entire Monty Python and the Holy Grail because I have a script. So I just know it. <laughs> I just know all the lines. Mm -hmm. But different people are going to have different tastes and will gravitate to, to specific genres. So if you find that you really like the experience of watching a science fiction film, for instance, you'll be more keen on seeking out more examples of that science yeah. fiction film. Same thing with horror or people who are just into drama. <clears throat> I think for me and what I would encourage anyone else to do, um, I want all of it. Cause I want, I want a, I want a big picture perspective of what people are. I want a big picture perspective of what consciousness is. I can't get that if I'm only watching science fiction. The same way I don't think I can get that if I'm only studying science. This is why philosophy and film are so interesting as disciplines because they can take the whole of human experience and put it in the same arena. It's, it, it's a way of dealing with everything at once. And maybe you just want it for that hour and a half that you watch a movie, but maybe you, maybe you wanna go deeper and and those resources are there. Those movies are there. Th that philosophy is there. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the end of my presentation. I have this wonderful quote from um, from Stanley Cavill. Um, so of film, he says. In the history of film, despite the plethora of attempts to define what film is, the beingness, the ontology of the image, or the nature of film as art, cinema seems to resist any such attempts at conceptual definition. It's hard to draw a line around it. It's hard to say, this is what cinema is. Because every time you try, it it deviates there's there's an exception to the rule and i think that's true of people too like anyone who wants to describe who you are as a person can try to draw an outline but it's not going to be the whole story and i think um that's a good way of thinking about the the similarities that we have with film and with ways of thinking about it so i hope that you all enjoyed this i'm so grateful that you came to my talk and please if you have any questions let me know i'm here i have a question what's your job um i work in <laughs> i work for a tech company i do customer support for um a photography web hosting company so it, it we, we build as... websites for photographers this presentation seems as a university matter. Thank you. One day, um, I am trying to get into a graduate program for specifically film and philosophy because I really love both of those things. And I was so grateful that Maria reached out to me to talk about these things that I love so much. So I, I went to school for film and philosophy in my undergrad. And um, since I didn't want to go straight to graduate school, I moved to North Carolina and did exactly what I've just been describing. I started going to lots of different kinds of movies and it gave me a chance to see film from lots of different perspectives and to, um, to write about it. So I started writing in earnest about film once I started going to the movies all the time. Is, is North Carolina a best place for cinema goers? Hmm. You'd be surprised. I was really surprised. There's so much amazing film programming here. That was how I was able to start the blog and keep it going because um, there's one film programmer who does lots of classic Hollywood films with strong female protagonists. And there's another who does like cult exploitation films from the 70s and 80s. There's another who does 16 millimeter educational and industrial films. 
There's um, a larger cinema that does retro screenings from lots of different genres. So um, it, it was surprising to me that North Carolina had so many resources for that, but it was really nice too. And uh, I'll also send you all the, the 16 millimeter educational industrial films are from the AV Geeks, uh, it's a guy, a local guy here who's collected 26,000 film reels. And if you wanna see what the United States was like in like the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, with very clear communication, it could be great for you guys since you're language students. I'll send a link to the AV Geeks. He does a live stream Monday through Friday for lunch during the quarantine. And it's just lots of these little films. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, trying to tell kids not to talk to strangers or how to make bread, how bread is made in a factory. It's like really random stuff. But a lot of times there are filmmakers who became really successful filmmakers who started doing by the, started by doing that kind of film. So um, there's one guy, Caleb Deschanel, who is Zoe Deschanel's dad. And um, he's a film director in his own right, cinematographer, but I was at one of these screenings and bam, Caleb Deschanel's name comes on. It's like the first film he ever made. And it's about this kid who gets lost because they're going to find like a ball. You think, do you think this is because you are near a major university or does it have anything to do with the fact that uh, there is a film industry in North Carolina actually? I think part of it is that there's a history of a film industry here. Part of it too is that there's a little bit more public support for the arts in North Carolina. Um, there's an arts conservatory that's state funded here and um and it's a pretty it's a pretty intense hub of activity there's duke university unc chapel hill nc state all very close to me so some of the film programming that i get to see is because of the universities um duke has a really amazing free screening program that i can walk to and I, I saw a Fassbender film for the first time at that screening series. So I, I would just encourage everybody always to find what's available to you, what's close, and then start digging and see what kind of underground stuff there is. Because I moved here and was here for a year before I found out about the Durham Cinematheque that does like... Um, strange experimental screenings once a month. Well, all our exploration nowadays has to be from our homes, but you definitely tickled us and we are eager to check out those links that you'll share. But I don't want to hold you anymore if, uh, if there's no more questions. Thank you so much, Katie. That was wonderful. I really appreciate your effort and I am sure that it was a very valuable experience for all our students. Yeah, if any of you ever have Thank questions, <laughs> talk to me about anything, please. Maria has my email address. I'll include my contact info with the, the materials that I send you. Even if you just want a native English speaker to chat with, Happy to get to know you all. Thank you so much for coming. Thank it's you, Katie. We love you. your accent. Fantastic accent. We love it. <gasps> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yes, it was a pleasure. You. Very nice. Here. I, think, I think today's at least of Spain is St. Catherine. Maybe it's your same day. Oh, definitely the same name. Katie is diminutive for Catherine. Another reason to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you all for coming. We will, Bye -bye. Share, we will share this video um, so that it can be accessible to everybody who couldn't be here. But yeah, thank you so much. And we hope there's more coming. So 
Take care and see you in the online classroom. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Take care.